In August 1945, World War II was brought to its chilling climax in two brilliant, blinding flashes of heat and destruction in the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But while one chapter of history ended, another began, that of the threat of nuclear armed conflict. Nuclear weapons changed the rules of global confrontation forever. They not only had the potential to inflict more damage onto an enemy than all other weapons used in the history of warfare combined, but they would also irradiate the land, poison the atmosphere, and destroy the environment to such an extent that large areas of land would become uninhabitable for possibly thousands of years. The world had never known such destructive power, and it was hoped that the fear of such weaponry would put an end to global conflicts. This was called the nuclear deterrence. Instead, it created an arms race that would result in a huge stockpile of these weapons to the point where we had sufficient destructive power to kill every last man, woman, and child on Earth several times over. But building such weapons is only half the story. They were useless unless they could be delivered onto a target. And as the Cold War began in the aftermath of the Second World War, that meant bombers. The first nuclear bomber was of course the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress, which dropped the atom bombs on Japan. But this aircraft was never designed for that role and had to be modified to make it suitable. The first atomic bombs were huge weapons for the aircraft to carry, being around 10,000 pounds, but it was not simply enough to carry them aloft. The bomber still had to fly high enough and fast enough to escape the blast and the shockwave it produced, which could literally shake an aircraft to pieces. As the bombs became more and more powerful, the requirements for the performance of the bombers also increased. The era of the super bombers had arrived. In 1947, the United States Air Force gained its independence from the US Army, and among the new branches formed within its ranks was Strategic Air Command, known as SAC. SAC was responsible for the Air Force's heavy bomber fleets, and this included delivering the country's nuclear arsenal. General Curtis LeMay was placed in charge of the new branch, and he impressed upon his men that by maintaining the most destructive force on the planet, they were therefore preventing war through the concept of deterrence. To that end, he chose the motto, Peace is our profession, for an organization which, even at its conception, had more potential firepower than in all of World War II under its personal control. The first task for LeMay was to re-equip units with newer, more suitable bomber aircraft for the mission than the B-29. As a stopgap, improvements were made to the B-29, which included new, more powerful engines. These updated aircraft were designated B-50s, as part of a ruse by Boeing and the Air Force to convince Congress that they were all new aircraft in order to secure funding for them, which was less likely if they were still called B-29s. But the B-50s lacked the true intercontinental range needed for SAC to attack all of the vast Soviet Union from the US, and so they would have to deploy from forward bases in allied countries nearer their targets during heightened tensions. The first bomber to truly give SAC its global reach was the awe-inspiring Conveyor B-36, nicknamed Peacemaker. Even by today's standards, the B-36 is an impressive machine, but by the standards of the late 1940s, it was practically the stuff of science fiction. Conceived in the early 40s as a way of bombing Germany from the United States if the United Kingdom fell to the Nazis, it was instead redesigned to carry America's nuclear arsenal into the 1950s. 
Early versions were powered by six 3,800 horsepower Pratt and Whitney 28-cylinder piston engines, but later models featured an additional four General Electric J47 jet engines for extra thrust, making the B36 a 10-engined warplane. As the crews of the B-36s and B-50s train to rain atomic weaponry down on the Soviet Union, across the Iron Curtain, the Soviet leadership were demanding a response to achieve nuclear parity with the Americans. Their own atomic bomb program, which benefited greatly from spies gathering intelligence on the American program, was given the highest priority, as was the development of aircraft to deliver them to the United States and her allies in Western Europe. However, unlike the Americans and the British, the Soviets hadn't prioritized strategic bomber development during World War II, instead preferring to build smaller, tactical aircraft with which to directly support the army on the battlefields. As such, they were some five years behind in terms of technology, and so, in order to catch up as quickly as possible, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin ordered the Tupolev Bureau to simply copy the B-29 as closely as possible. Three B-29s were interned in the Soviet Union during the war after being damaged on raids over Japan. The team at Tupolev copied everything down to the last detail, and it was reported that some of the first Soviet-built B-29s, known as the Tupolev 24, actually had the Boeing logo reproduced on the pedals in their cockpits. However, these planes were not identical copies of the B-29. It was a marginally slower machine, heavier, with more powerful engines and better armed, featuring 10 23mm cannons mounted in pairs along the fuselage and in the tail. Unlike SAC, the Soviet Union did not have Allied bases throughout the world with which to station the Tu-4. While it had the range to threaten Western European allies, the aircraft had to deploy rudimentary bases in the Arctic wastes to attack Canada and the United States, leading Western intelligence to theorize that in wartime, the Soviet pilots would be tasked to fly a one-way mission, using all the fuel available to reach the furthest targets and costing them their lives for the glory of the motherland. Once the Tu-4 was establishing itself in service, the Soviets began looking at improving upon it, which resulted in the Tu-80. The most obvious difference between the Tu-80 and the Tu-4 was the redesigned cockpit area which featured a more traditional steeped design rather than the bulbous, glazed window arrangement inherited from the B-29. It's also possible the Soviets adopted this new arrangement simply as a way of distinguishing it from its American forebear. The 280 was further developed into the 285, which became the ultimate expression of the B-29 design and was intended to finally give the Soviets the range they needed to credibly compete in the Cold War. Powered by more fuel-efficient piston engines and featuring increased fuel capacity, as well as a more efficient wing, the 285 had a range well in excess of 7,000 miles, twice the 24. But alas, only two prototypes were ever built before it was cancelled. As the Korean War broke out in 1950, American B-29s began a bombing campaign against North Korea, where they were decimated by Soviet-supplied MiG-15 jet fighters. The writing was on the wall for the piston engine bomber. The jet bomber was the death machine of the future. Even the B-36 Peacemaker, the pride of the United States Air Force with its heavy defensive armament, was still a huge target for swarms of jet fighters, and this even led to experiments being carried out whereby the B-36 would carry its own parasite defensive fighter, which would detach if the bomber was attacked. SAC did introduce a jet-powered bomber in 1951, the B-47, but it lacked the range LeMay needed. However, the US had realized early that the B-36 would have to be replaced in the 1950s, and so issued specifications for a new jet-powered replacement. Conveyor submitted their own YB-60 design to the United States, which was a development of the B-36, but featuring swept wings and eight jet engines. <laughs> 
However, this design was rejected in favour of Boeing's proposal, and on April 15th, 1952, the first prototype of one of the most legendary aircraft of all time took to the skies, the B-52 Stratofortress. The B-52 could fly higher, faster, longer, and carry more offensive weapons than its predecessors, and with the use of air-to-air -air refueling, it pioneered the concept of maintaining airborne alerts. B-52s would fly fully armed with nuclear weapons near or around Soviet territory, ready to attack if war suddenly broke out. However, the practice was extremely dangerous, and after a series of accidents, including a B-52 colliding with its tanker over Spain and its nuclear weapons falling on Spanish territory, it was discontinued in 1968. Across the Iron Curtain, in 1952, the Soviets revealed their answer to the B-52, in the form of the Miyasishev M-4. Western observers always watched the annual Moscow May Day Parade where the Soviet Union would show off their latest weaponry with keen interest, and on this particular occasion, they were stunned by the sight of wave after wave of this new, four-engined, swept-winged bomber, which they theorised had the performance to threaten the United States. However, this was all a ruse. Instead, they were seeing the same bomber over and over again, but it left the Americans fearing that the Soviets had hundreds of them, generating a high level of fear in the Pentagon. This fear was ultimately unfounded, for not only did the Soviets only ever build 93 airframes, but the M4's engines were so thirsty that its range fell short of what the Soviets intended. Already knowing this, the Soviet's Tupolev Design Bureau were hard at work producing new designs in an effort to catch up with the Americans. The first was the 216, a twin-engined, swept-wing design which first took to the air just over a week after the B-52, although it was closer in performance to the B-47. Unusually, in this story of bomber development, the 216 achieved export success, being sold to Soviet allies such as Egypt, Libya, Iraq, Indonesia, and most notably China, who, to this day, still fly a domestically produced version, known as the Xi'an H6. Just a few months after the 216 first flew, another bomber, perhaps just as legendary as the B-52, took to the sky in the form of the 295, known to NATO by the codename Bear. Unlike all other designs then in the works which adopted jet engines, the 295 instead utilised turboprop engines driving contra-rotating propellers to achieve the speed and, just as importantly, the range needed by the Soviet military to threaten the United States. A turboprop engine is still a jet engine, but instead of relying solely on thrust to propel it forward, it drives a prop at the front and has the advantage of being more fuel efficient. The propellers on the 295 would often spin so fast that they would actually break the sound barrier, and the aircraft was so loud that NATO fighter pilots sent to intercept them complained that their roar overpowered the sound of their own jet engines. But there are more players in this story than just the Soviets and the Americans. Britain was also developing its own bomber fleet in the form of the V-Force. These three bombers, the Valiant, Victor, and Vulcan, were broadly in the same class as the B-47 and the 216, which met British needs since they were closer to their targets in Eastern Europe than SAC was. The Vulcan, with its huge delta wing, was especially jaw-dropping to see in flight, and on some of its earlier test flights, the all-white bomber was reported by people on the ground as a UFO. To the people of the time, this was science fiction, brought to life and thrown into their skies. During an early appearance at the Farnborough Air Show, its pilots barrel-rolled the aircraft, much to the glee of the crowd and the disdain of the safety wardens. All these new designs were high, subsonic aircraft, and while impressive as far as the bomber designs were concerned, the lessons of the B-29s over Korea still served to remind military planners that jet fighters would always be faster, and while bombers like the B-47 could fly higher than some of the Soviet fighters in the early 50s, it was only a matter of time before fighter technology caught up. To make matters even worse, it was at this time in the late 1950s that a new weapon was appearing to threaten the bomber, 
surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs. SAMs were viewed by many across the world as being so deadly that they would even displace fighters altogether. They could reach any height and speed a bomber could fly, leading bomber pilots being forced to drop down to treetop height to evade them, a role the B-52 or 295 was not designed for. Military planners and weapon manufacturers knew they had to address these concerns soon, or risk the bombers becoming totally ineffective. Two paths were taken to address the threats to the bombers. The first was for the bombers to stop using the direct attack method of delivering free-fall nuclear bombs, and instead utilize long-range nuclear-armed missiles. These had the advantage of keeping the attacking bomber out of the range of defensive weapons. The B-52, 216, and 295, as well as the British Victor and Vulcan bombers, all adopted cruise missiles. But the early weapons were large, slow, and relatively inaccurate. Both the United Kingdom and Americans developed the Skybolt missile for their B-52 and Vulcan fleets respectively, which was billed as being an air-launched intercontinental ballistic missile, but it was an overly complex system and was eventually cancelled. The alternative to missiles was to build a bomber with performance equivalent to, or even surpassing, the fighters that would be sent against it. Embracing their technological edge, the US aviation industry produced the Convair B-58 Hustler, which was designed to have supersonic dash capabilities so that it could bypass defenses. And once again, we return to that science fiction analogy. This sounds like something straight out of a Flash Gordon serial, doesn't it? The supersonic dash capabilities. Well, although the Mach 2, or twice the speed of sound capable B-58 projected power and performance to the casual observer, in reality it was difficult to fly, overly complex, required heavy tanker support to give it an effective range, and was rather accident prone. It would serve just 10 years in the USAF before being withdrawn. However, at the same time that the B-58 was entering service, the United States was already developing one of the most astonishing aircraft to ever fly. The North American XB-70 Valkyrie was a six-engined, long-range strategic bomber capable of flying at an incredible Mach 3, far in excess of all Soviet interceptors in service in 1964 when it first flew. In fact, the Soviets were so alarmed by this aircraft that they began developing the MiG-25 fighter specifically to intercept it. And although the MiG-25 could match the speed of the Valkyrie, it would have to plan its attack very carefully, since it did not have the necessary speed to overtake it. The Soviets also developed their own equivalents to the Hustler and the Valkyrie. Miyasisev produced the M50, known to NATO as the Bounder, which promised to match the Hustler, but in tests fell short of Mach 2 before the project was scrapped. The Tupolev Design Bureau produced the 222, which was capable of a supersonic dash to bypass enemy defenses, but like the Hustler, it was difficult to fly and rather accident prone but it was arguably more successful than the American plane, enjoying a much longer service life and being exported to allies such as Libya, who used them to successfully attack French airfields in Chad, and Iraq, who bombed Iran with them in the 1980s. The Soviet Valkyrie emerged in the form of the Sukhoi T-4, a much smaller and less advanced aircraft, but the will to develop it was now quickly waning in Moscow. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launched the world's first artificial satellite into orbit, off the back of a rocket that was originally developed to carry a nuclear bomb to the United States. The almost ever-present problem of developing bombers with the range to attack the United States led to the Soviets instead turning to long-range rocketry. On February 9th, 1959, the R-7 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile became operational in the Soviet Union. And whereas before it would take hours for bombers on either side to reach their targets, now the Soviets could destroy a city in the West in under an hour. Even more frighteningly, they were almost impossible to shoot down. <laughs> 
Given these advantages and the disappointment of their bomber program, the Soviets now poured most of their resources into long-range missiles, as did the Americans to counter them. In the Soviet Union, many 216s and 295s found themselves adopting an intelligence-gathering role while in the United States. The B-52 was re-rolled for conventional bombing missions over Vietnam, while the jaw-dropping XB-70 was instead used for high-speed research before retiring after a lethal collision with an escort fighter. In one Mach 3 flight, the Valkyrie covered 2,400 miles in an eye-watering 91 minutes. Just for perspective, 20 years earlier, B-17s were bombing Germany at a speed of just 180 miles per hour, while a modern airliner such as the Airbus A320 would take just over four hours to cover the same distance. But while ICBMs were taking over as the primary means of nuclear deterrence, both the US and the Soviet Union were reluctant to give up on their bombers entirely. They instead adopted a supporting role. The B-52 and the 295, both of which were expected to last around 10 to 15 years in service, saw their lives being extended and their effectiveness improved with the addition of more advanced air-launched cruise missiles. Bombers offered the option to conduct a more limited nuclear exchange instead of the all-out nuclear Armageddon that ICBMs were expected to conduct. They also adopted numerous other roles, with the B-52 being used to drop sea mines and fire anti-ship missiles, among other duties. Rather than being the end of the bombers, the ICBMs instead rationalized the development of new bombers to just a few designs. In the 1970s, the US began to work on the Rockwell B-1A strategic bomber. This was designed from the outset to fly at an ultra-low level in order to avoid detection by Soviet defenses and to utilize a variable geometry swing wing which improved performance across the entire flight envelope. Despite its size, the B-1 had extraordinary agility, which helped it weave through valleys guided by its terrain, following radar, and could still fly at Mach 1.2. The B-1A was cancelled by the Carter administration in 1977, but was resurrected by President Reagan as the B-1B Lancer in 1981. However, it was another American bomber that looked set to change the rules of the game forever. This was the Northrop B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber. The B-2 was designed to be undetectable by Soviet radar, thus negating Soviet defenses altogether. Both aircraft had long development cycles, which saw the B-52's life being continually extended. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was itself developing new bombers. A replacement for the Tu-22 came in the form of the Tu-22M, which, despite sharing a similar designation, was an entirely new machine, featuring variable geometry wings like the B-1. But even more like the B-1 was the Tu-160. At first glance, you could be forgiven for thinking the 2160 was just a copy of the B-1, but it was a significantly more powerful aircraft, being almost twice as fast with longer range, despite being both larger and heavier. It seemed that after decades of lagging behind the United States, as the Cold War came to an end, the Soviet Union actually possessed the most high-performance bomber in the world, but only 36 would ever be built. After the Cold War concluded, bombers were expected to be phased out once and for all, but the adaptability of the B-52 and the Tu-95 meant that there were always roles for them to carry out. In fact, both aircraft have seen extensive use in the close air support role in combat against Islamic State as recently as early 2020, using precision-guided weaponry. At present, the B-52 is expected to remain in service with the United States in some form or another until 2050, long after the B-1 and B-2 have been withdrawn and almost 100 years since the first flight of the first prototype. An impressive feat for any aircraft, particularly one that was expected to last a mere 10 years, perhaps making it the truest example of the perfect super bomber.